Welcome back to the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. I'm Derek Rackley, joined with my guys, DJ Shockley and Dave Archer. And, of course, fellas, before we get into uh, what transpired in the Falcons-Cardinals game of last weekend, as we record this podcast, uh, it is Tuesday morning, January 3rd. Um, obviously, um, a sad day in the NFL last night. DeMar Hamlin, of course, um, had to get some very serious medical attention on the field, and, and pretty much everybody knows uh, the story behind that. Uh, our thoughts and our prayers are with him, his family, uh, the entire organization, and, and quite frankly, all of the football players that were uh, on the field last night that saw all of this come down. So, Dave, DJ, let's first start by just getting your guys' um, kind of thoughts on this. It's, a, it's, it's unprecedented territory. We have all been in games, we've broadcasted games where unfortunately somebody has to be attended to by medical uh, staff and a cart comes out, an ambulance comes out, but generally you get a thumbs up, you get some type of reaction um, and the scary part was that didn't happen last night. So it's hard for us to sit here and say, Dave, DJ, what was your thoughts from something like that that's happened in your past? Because... I'd be willing to bet it hasn't happened in your past. But, DJ, let me start with you. As, as you kind of saw everything unfold, what was going through your mind as a, as a former player thinking about this and trying to put yourself as best as possible in the shoes of those guys that were on the field last night? Yeah, Rick, I, you know what? Uh, the first thing that came to mind was a, a couple things um, that when you watch it, and you don't really understand what's happening at the moment. And the only visual that you have is how his teammates are taking it at that moment. And at that time, it was so emotional to watch his teammates. You can see Josh Allen. You can see guys that on the defensive side of the ball. You can see his entire team. You can see guys literally bawling, crying. And in that moment, I you know – Throughout my years playing, I've seen, you know, guys break legs. I've, you know, torn ACL. I've seen, you know, uh, bones come out of, you know, guys, you know, legs, whatever it may be, and you know they're okay. And when you watch the playback of the particular incident and you watch him get up and you watch him collapse again and then immediately you see all his teammates just come to his aid and then the first thing that comes to mind is – his family, and you hear his mom has to come out of the stands. So thankful that his mom was able to be there. Yeah. Um, in that moment, I'm sitting with my wife and my daughter, and we're watching it, and, you know, 10 minutes into it, my wife just grabs my hand, grabs my wife's hand, and we just start praying because she says, I remember a time when, you were playing against the Buffalo Bills, and you went down, and I wasn't there, and I didn't get an update. I didn't know what was going on with you. Mm -hmm. And she instantly went to praying because she said in that moment, the first thing I thought about was his family and how they felt. So just so thankful his mom was able to be there and not have to wait on a phone call to hear what's going on with her baby boy. And to – Watch the reactions from all his teammates. I really just I, – I was – I was – I felt it so deep because I understand what it's like. And I don't think people – you have to understand, these guys are together all the time. You have built a relationship with your teammates because you're around him all the time. You know about his family. You know about things he's going through. You know what's going on in his personal life. And to visually watch one of your teammates – on the field, and they have to give him CPR. You have, you're trying to restore his heart. He's not breathing on his own. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is so different from, like you mentioned, seeing a guy go on a stretch and you see the thumbs up or you see a guy laying on the ground, but you can see him moving. This was something totally different. I don't think nobody else could see. And internally – I had goosebumps just watching it because I could put myself in that moment and say, you know what? Every guy on that field that night who had on shoulder pads looked at DeMar Hamlin and said, my God, that could be me. Mm -hmm. And I think that one is registered the most that this is just a game. People are looked at, people look at these athletes and look at these professional players as guys who make millions of dollars. 
But you forget that these guys put their life on the line. Yeah. Every time you go out. And I say even as athletes, we don't realize every time you go out, there is a chance of something like this catastrophically happen to you. And to be in that moment, I just instantly just pray for him, pray for his family. We're still praying for him, still praying for his family. And it's just one of those instances that you put so many things in per- in perspective and it goes so far beyond football, goes so far beyond the game, and it's all about the actual man. DJ, between yourself, me, Arch, you, between high school, college, and the NFL, we have a lot of years of football. Like you just talked about it, DJ. We we signed up for playing an extremely physical, yeah. extremely physical game where, like DJ said, there is a chance of not only injury, but some type of serious injury. And we all know that. But, Arch, we don't ever think about what could have happened like last night to DeMar. And my question to you is, we, we talk so much about, DJ mentioned it, football players, they make so much money. At the end of the day, this is a human being that is fighting as we record this podcast. And, again, it's, it's hard to put yourself in that position, but you mentioned it, like, there was no way those guys were going to go play a football game after what they saw on the field. Like, that was way too emotional for them because, like DJ said, it wasn't just their teammate. That was their brother that was down on the field. Not just the Buffalo Bills, but the Cincinnati Bengals because it's all a brotherhood. Absolutely. Uh, well stated, uh, Rack. And, and, and let's, be, let's, let's pump the brakes a little bit on blaming the National Football League for not shutting the game down right away. There was a lot of things that needed to be sorted out at the time as to what was going on. Number one was the care of the player. Uh, and they were doing everything they possibly could on the field. The EMT units had come out, and they were doing everything they could there. I know there was some talk about them continuing to play the game. This was an unprecedented a- a situation, as you guys said. But I do feel like that they did a nice job of kind of sorting it out. The two coaches came together. There was a conversation there. They talked about where their two teams were mentally. Certainly Buffalo affected a little bit more maybe than Cincinnati, but not too much. Both teams are sitting there watching what was going on. I thought the two coaches came together. And then, of course, you saw the conversation with the league. The league ultimately makes the decision we're not going to play football. I don't think they were ever going to play football because either one of the either the Bills or Cincinnati was interested in playing that night, no matter what they said in New York. But New York, I thought they did a nice job of kind of – there's been a lot of criticism. They should have canceled it right then and there. I thought there was a conversation, and there's a lot more to it. You've got 70,000 fans in there that are going to spill out all at the same time. There was there was concern maybe for safety of fans. There's a lot of stuff to consider. So think about the entire big picture about what's going on. They weren't going to play football, but they needed to come to that conclusion by sorting through all the things. Let's, let's say that first of all. The thing that comes to mind, and, and shock, really went through it there and very eloquently talked about the feelings and stuff. So now where do you move forward from here? Every team in the league saw this last night, or if they didn't, they're getting clips and seeing it or reading it on social media. What do you do now by the league or per team to now counsel these players? Because you guys know we all kind of try to find a way, we're human beings try to find a way to categorize what happened to him. Okay, well – there was a pre-existing condition there, and so that doesn't apply to me, so I, I can kind of slide by. That may not be the case. This may be one of those once in a, in a million shots where he took a shot in the wrong spot at the wrong time, and that makes all of us vulnerable to play this game. High school, college, pro level, I don't care who it is. So now how do we get our head around that and get some counseling and some ideas and some safety pieces that maybe need to be in, put in place there's a lot to sort out here. We're not going to be able to sort that out here on this podcast, but we wanted to give our, our, our thoughts to you as the fans out there of how we're feeling. I, 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 I was crushed when I saw it. I don't even know this kid. I did a couple of his kids in, co- in games in college, but we're of the same brotherhood. We played in the game together, and we know what it's like to be on the field and, and be in it. And like Shock talked about the brotherhood and, and the camaraderie, both – the guys on the other side of the field and our guys. We're all in the same fraternity. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective as a fan as to how we feel about it and how it's probably being felt around the league and how the league's going to have to now look at this and make some evaluations, maybe just from a counseling standpoint to all the players 
that saw this and are uneasy about the situation. Yeah. Well, we're going to continue to send our thoughts and prayers to him and his family, the entire Buffalo Bills organization, as well as the Cincinnati Bengals. And and uh, we're praying hard that we're going to get Absolutely. Um, some good news. So um, one of the, the most difficult segues we could ever do. Absolutely. Uh, but we will do our best to try to pivot away from that situation and uh, talk a little bit about the Falcons' previous game against the Arizona Cardinals. They are able to... Snap a four-game losing streak this past Sunday. Comeback victory. They get a 20-19 to win over Arizona. And, Arch, I'm going to come back to you again calling the game. Let's – a lot of the, the focus right now is on the young players as they're getting thrusted into action – and the organization, the head coach, is trying to figure out what they have in these guys, right? So we're getting another sample set of Desmond Ritter. We're getting more of Tyler Algier. We're starting to see more of Drake London. I'm not trying to pigeonhole you into one of those three guys, but tell us some of the positives that you saw in the game that helped them ultimately pull out this victory. Well, it starts up front, guys. Their ability to control the line of scrimmage in the run game continues to be a part of the mix, and that's going to be, as you begin to grasp on things moving forward, those are the kind of things that I latch on to. Your ability to control the line of scrimmage in the run game, Shock and I will both tell you, and you played some quarterback as well, the best friend of a quarterback is to be able to run it. <laughs> and this team can run it. they got two guys that are ferocious running the football, and they've got an offensive line that wants to come off the football. That's going to help you in the pass game as well. But as far as, as far as the young players, I think that really probably is the focus. And certainly the young quarterback, I think Desmond continues to show his ability, and, and, and it probably to me – even harkens back to what he was in college. He played 50 games in college, major college football, 50 games. He was 44-6. and six. He never lost a game at home in Cincinnati. He just extended that streak here in Atlanta as a starter. <laughs> he now is undefeated in Atlanta as a starter in our building. He's now 27-0 and 0 as a starter, uh, if you will, in college and pro football, So, which is cool. Um, but uh, the ability to win in your own building, Okay, this was a team that was 4-12 and 12 the last two seasons in their own building. They're 5-3 and three this season. As you begin to turn the page and yep. change the culture and kind of mold it the way you want to, much like you do in the run game, and the young quarterback is a part of that. I thought he, he continues to make throws that kind of belie his years a little bit, back shoulder throws, ball placement, his ability to heat it up, the deep shot he took to Bird. I thought Bird was interfered with on the play, but it's a deep shot that's right on the money. And then – how about Arthur Smith's trust on third down with a minute 53 left in the game? It's third and seven. You could have very easily run the football, make them burn a timeout, kick a field goal with about 145 left, and then hold on and try to win the game defensively. He didn't do that. He put it in the young quarterback's hands on third and seven. He finds Michael Pruitt for a 14-yard gain that shoves That's the ball throw. down to the 10-yard line. And it was a tight window throw <laughs> now. I mean, it was a, a full pattern deal. He had to discern where he wanted to go. He thought – I even talked to Arthur, and he said, I thought he was going to go to London, but he rotated back inside and find, found Michael Pruitt over the middle. Michael rolls for another thirteen, another five or six yards and gets the first down. But the whole part of it was he put him up to bat when the game was on the line. Yeah. And we've seen that repeatedly now. Fourth down in New Orleans, he makes the throw to London. Ultimately, it was a fumble, but he makes the play to put you in position. He did it again. He did some stuff like that in Baltimore. And here he wins the football game, not he, but the team wins the football game because they load it on his back and he makes the right decision. All those things bode well for me as you move forward. Art, you think about some of the play calling decisions that you had that you highlighted there. It's it's not Arthur Smith being conservative and trying to just help him out with the run game, right? In critical situations, he's saying, I want to see what the young fella can do. Yeah. We've seen him do it in college. We've seen him do it in practice. I want to see him do it on NFL field now. And not only is he calling the plays, the young fella is executing those yeah. plays. Um, yes, the run game helps because you talk about after that, they end up running the ball for another first down to basically salt away their chance of kicking the field goal and limit Arizona, any Arizona chance to come back into the game. But, DJ, he talked a lot about Desmond Ritter. 73% completion rate, does not throw a touchdown, but he also does not throw an interception. But Algier just, again, bruising, 20 carries, 83 yards, CP punching it in for a touchdown, running the football as well. What stuck out to you as positives offensively? Let me uh, kind of piggyback and go back to what you guys just talked about with Ritter. And we, we talk about some of the stuff, and, and Arch just did a really good job of talking about some of the things that happened in game. And I know sometimes fans want to equate it 
to stats or numbers and say, okay, do the stats and numbers match? Let's go back to the last two weeks. Last two weeks, he is 41 or 59. He completed 66% versus Baltimore. And you just mentioned it, Rack. He completed 73% versus Arizona. So he's completed 69% over the first – over these last two ball games. First ball game was 50%. So now we're talking about growth. Look at the last two ball games. He's steadily getting better. 66% two weeks ago, 73% in this ball game. In the first game that he ever started versus in New Orleans, he got sacked four times. Next two ball games, only three times. That tells you right there the ball's getting out of his hands. He understands where to go with the football. Now, sometimes the stuff happens and maybe it's not his, it's not his issue. Maybe a guy gets beat, whatever it is. But it's the growth that you're seeing in his completion percentage. You're seeing it in inside the pocket. You're talking about efficiency. You're talking about him seeing the field clear. It's things like that that shows you that from one game to the next, all you want to see is progression. You're seeing progression steadily climb regardless of – you know, who's out there on the field with him, who you're playing against, what's going on in that ball game. This is a guy that's continually to get – he's continuing getting better each and every week. And you talk about Algier, who's got 900 yards rushing on the season as a rookie. And this is a guy who's 123 yards away from the rookie record who was set by William Andrews. You talk about some a guy who is – Maybe the the bell cow for this offense, and whenever you hand him the football, good things happen. And I thought one of the more telling plays in this ball game was doesn't drops it out to him for two, three yards in a flat. Makes one guy miss, makes two guys miss, and boom, hits it for another five, six yard. Picks up a first down. We talked about it last week. That's something that's starting to grow even more from him. And maybe he's done it for a while, but he's showing it even more this year, the fact that he can be that every down guy. He can be a guy who can catch it out the backfield and make guys miss and continue to do it. I thought the use of CP is exactly what I think this team needs. He had nine carries for 42 yards, six receptions for 42 yards. That tells you he is being used in multiple ways inside this offense and even had a rushing touchdown. Uh, you know, you, you want to take away maybe the, the formal snap. That's something that he can learn from, obviously, moving with the center and all that kind of stuff. But I just love the growth by all three of these guys on the offensive side of the ball for sure. And it shows you week in and week out that they're starting to grow and become even better players inside this league. And as we know, you got to play the game. And both these, all these guys are getting put up to bat, and, and they're proving it. But I, I just love the, the point that you made, Arch, about it being third and seven and you're putting your quarterback up the bat, and he's making a play. That's so much trust. How much confidence does that give him that, hey, my coach believes in me in this key moment, deep in the ball game, at home, games, you know, in the balance, and he says, you know what, I'm putting it in your hands, Rook, and he made the play. You know what, and, it, and it's not lost on Ritter either. I asked Ritter the question after the game in our post – post-game uh, interview, and then I had a chance to talk to him in our player spotlight on the on the Arthur Smith Coaches Show on radio on Monday. I asked him back-to-back days about it, and it meant a lot to him. Don't think that that was lost on him, that he didn't recognize mm-hmm. that. I mean, sometimes those things happen in a game, and you don't really think about what just happened, but it, he was readily on, on the ball on what that meant for the coach to put him into up to bat and trust him enough to make that play. Yeah, that he's got the faith in me in a critical situation that I'm not going to just turn around and be ultra conservative. The coach is putting it on my shoulders. He wants me to go out there and make a play. And, <laughs> no and DJ, I want to piggyback real quick on one thing you were talking about with Algier. One thing I like about him is for a young player – you rarely see him lose yards, mm-hmm. okay? And the other thing that I like about him is and, – and here's what what I see from calling college football games to the transition to the NFL, and I'm sure you guys see this as well, and, and nobody taught me mo- this more than Alex Gibbs when he was coaching the running game here for the Falcons, is getting north and south, finding a way to get one or two. Like Alex Gibbs used to always say – Give me one or two, <laughs> but don't you dare give me minus three or four. Yeah. DJ, you remember it. Oh, no now, doubt. there was a couple other colorful words that were thrown <laughs> in there. But his ability to get north and south yeah. and find the smallest of gaps just to pick up something yeah. puts the offense in a much better situation. And second and nine is better than second and 13. It's unbelievable that you mention that because there's so many times you think about him being a big bruiser kind of back. But there's so many times you see him get skinny. He's there's got escapability. So many times you see him just slide through a little small hole and find two or three yards in there, like you mentioned, and that keeps your offense 
and, and going in the, in the positive, right, staying ahead of the change. He's, he's been fun to watch, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, there's a, the, a run in the game that epitomizes exactly what you're talking about. He literally runs through. Uh, the middle linebacker slides across. He runs right through him and then does a little sidestep, little sachet to the right, little <laughs> dance move, and gets you another eight. So in one play down there in the red zone, he epitomized what you're talking about, Shock. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. All right, guys, let's let's fast forward to the final game of the season. Uh, six and ten Falcons are going to face the eight and eight Buccaneers. Tampa Bay's feeling a little bit of momentum. They they were able to clinch their spot in the postseason. They beat the Carolina Panthers last weekend, uh, 30 to 24. And guys, I didn't think uh, that we would talk about this. We're, you know, we always talk about the weapons, right? And one weapon for Tampa this year that we have not talked about is Mike Evans. Mm. And up. Mike Evans not only woke up, <laughs> he said, there's a reason why I go for 1,000 yards yeah. year after year after year, Man. as he just dominates last weekend. So I don't not want to just sit here and, and discount everybody else, DJ, but is it a little bit of worrisome for Atlanta to face – Tampa Bay that now Brady and Evans have found the connection that's been kind of missing all season long. Yeah, and then uh, I read a clip where uh, I guess they were asking Evans about the game and what was going on, and he said, Tom came to me and said, I'm going to keep feeding you. And that's what is probably the scariest thing is, regardless, like, Let's go. <laughs> regardless of coverage, regardless of what's going on, he's going to keep feeding the big dude. Yeah. And there were a couple times you can see if you watch the game, He's not even looking at Mike. He's going through other progressions. All of a sudden, you see Mike running down the, you know, running the go route, and he just lets it fly and he go gets it. I yeah. mean, that's 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 scary, and it's hitting in the right time for them uh, coming into obviously the playoffs. They solidified that spot last week by beating Carolina, but it's always been Mike Evans. He's always been a big issue, regardless of who he's had thrown in the football. And like you mentioned, I think it was what, eight, nine consecutive seasons where he over a thousand yards, yeah. and he continues to be that guy for you, and it continues to be an ultra competitor, and, yeah, the Falcons are going to have their, their hands full, and that's what you want, though. You, you want to go play against the best. You want to play uh, against a, a guy who has that kind of cachet about him because you want to know where you are. And I think, you know, you got guys like A.J. Terrell who will not shy away from that matchup. He will be looking for that matchup, and I love that about it. So it's going to be a fun fun game to see. Uh, obviously, I, I think they, they mentioned, you know, Tybos wants to play a starter, so we'll see uh, how, how that plays out. But this will be – a unique matchup for sure. Yeah, I don't know if this is – again, I'm not coaching the Buccaneers, but I don't know if this is the season where it's a 12-4 and four and they're comfortable, they're hitting on all cylinders yeah. going into the postseason. They might need to build a little bit more momentum. Yes, you got one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback into the game, that's going to the postseason again. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like they need to continue to find some offensive consistency going into the postseason. Arch, what sticks out to you as some of the biggest – uh, areas, keys to this game? Well, if you go back to the game, I believe it was in week six, back when it seems like a, a lifetime ago, they won the game 21-15, to 15 and they held on in the game. Remember, they jumped out 21-3, to three, uh, and they were using their short passing attack. Evans had four for 81 in the game, so it wasn't like he wasn't used in the game. But Atlanta wasn't willing to give up the deep shot. Played a lot of zone coverage, matchup zone yeah. underneath, and Fournette caught 10 balls in the game. But Atlanta got the run game cranked up. Remember, this was the game where maybe Arthur put a little signature on a game where you didn't give up on the run game. You're down 21-3 to in the second half. They didn't give up on it, and, and rightly so. Atlanta ends up going for over 150 yards in the game and climbs right back into the football game. And, of course, everybody remembers the call that was made uh, on Grady Great. Jarrett on the, on the sack that they, they essentially gave them life to allow yeah. them to win the yeah. football game. Um, Things that stick out to me, okay, they had five sacks in that game. That can't happen in this game. They yep. cannot get after Ritter that way. We're going to protect better. 
uh, and that was with a good running game that they were able to sack Marcus Mariota in that game five times. Got to limit the sacks there. Um, and I think that you will continue to see a very similar game plan where they're not going to allow the explosives. This is a, uh, a Tampa offense, even back when they went to the Super Bowl, since he's been in, in, in Tampa Bay uh, and Tom Brady, is they live on explosives. If you don't give up explosive plays, then the game is going to be very similar to what we've seen over the last five weeks. It's going to come down in the high teens, low 20s, yep. and the game is going to be in doubt in the fourth quarter because, believe it or not, Atlanta defensively, and I know everybody's saying, oh, they're not very good on defense. Teams in the last five games are 6 for 16 in the red zone. That's 33%, just around 34%, something like that in the red zone. That would lead the National Football League by 10%. Mm-hmm. Buffalo leads the league for the entire regular season at 44%. This team over the last five games has limited teams just 34% touchdown conversion in the red zone. That's winning football. Mm-hmm. And that will continue. I think that will continue. Uh, so you don't give up the explosives and make them make them play the long game, put yep. plays together. We've seen them self-destruct. They're going to have penalties. Most teams do, right? Those are the kind of things that I think sticking out in this game. Obviously, you're going to have to continue to run it. And I think uh, Marcus will bring a dimension into the game in this building with his connection with Drake London that seems to be emerging. One thing I want to add to what Arch talked about, especially on the defensive side of the ball, is obviously the last five games only giving up 21 points or less. That's real big. I talked to Arch just talked about how well they've been doing in situational uh, scenarios, especially in the red zone. And I heard last week when you talked to all the guys after the game about – situations matter and they, how they've struggled in the situations of the game. Last week versus Arizona, one of four in the red zone. Third down, four of 11. Mm-hmm. Those are winning the situations of the game, and ultimately that's what bodes well when you play a team like Tampa. You play any team, to be honest, when you win those aspects of the game, you got a good chance of winning the game. One thing, Tampa has not been running the football consistently very well, and that you think that that bodes well for any team against them. However, this might be one of two or three quarterbacks <laughs> at all time where it's like, well, oh, just because no. you got to make him throw it all the time, that doesn't make your chances a whole lot better. But if you can make them one-dimensional, any team, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help your situation out, but you got to make sure that they don't let anybody get behind the defense. And then, as always, guys, turnovers has got to be, especially with a young offense. Like, you can't afford to give Tom Brady first and 10 at, at Atlanta 35-yard line after a turnover. So they're going to have to make sure that they're really, really smart and tight with the football. Rack. And, in this game. And another thing is you're going to have to cash in your opportunities. Atlanta has been a little bit laxed in the red zone offensively themselves. We've got to be better when we get down tight. It's nice to have Koo and he can bang it through from everywhere, but you need to close with some touchdowns. You need to put some touchdowns on the board uh, because you're only going to get so many chances with the football. Atlanta's been averaging about nine or ten possessions a game. Normally in an NFL game, you guys know 12 to 13 possessions for both teams is normal. We're probably about three possessions under that, maybe even more. Only nine possessions this last the last time we played Tampa. Mm-hmm. They only had the ball nine times. Like Ten in the game last week. So, so you've got to make sure that you maximize your opportunities, and it can't be settling for field goals. You've got to right. be able to cash in your opportunities. Absolutely. So uh, final game of the season chance for Atlanta to go to 7-10 and 10 on the season. And, uh, yeah, I guess it would be good to, to make Tampa go into the postseason on a loss. Uh, especially if it's a division rival that's uh, going to be representing you in the playoffs. Might not uh, be a bad thing to uh, spoil things for them a little bit. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for once more. Uh, I want to say that our thoughts and prayers are going out to DeMar Hamlin. Um, again, whatever you can do, young man, to keep fighting, uh, the entire NFL community is uh, praying and Absolutely. pulling for you. Um, on behalf of DJ Shockley and Dave Archer, I am Derek Rackley. Thanks so much for joining us again here on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. Good luck to the Atlanta Falcons this weekend, facing off in their final game of the season against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Hey, Take shock. care, everyone. Hey, Shock, fear the frog. <laughs> <laughs> frogs? The frogs. <laughs>